everyone, and welcome to our sixth session in the Modeling Biology by Domain seminar series. Today, we're going to be covering neurological systems. So if you've been following the seminar series so far, we've been exploring how to model different biological domains, trying to build from um, single scale domains such as protein signaling or metabolism and or um, gene expression, and then slowly building up to multi-scale systems such as cardiac tissue, whole cell modeling, neurological systems, uh, which we'll be covering today. And then we'll also have two more sessions coming up in July and August. So we hope you'll be able to attend those as well. So in terms of our seminar format, we're going to go through a brief introduction, um, then we'll go into our talk by our invited speaker, and then we'll have a group discussion to follow. So the goals for our sessions here are to identify common challenges across multiple bi biological domains in modeling, to share our personal experiences and our solutions to problems that we've come, that have co we've come up against in our modeling endeavors, to brainstorm new solutions and new potential software developments that could support modeling and create a collaborative community of modelers. Our guidelines for this session are to err on the side of commenting during our discussion session. Honest debate is encouraged, but please mute your microphone when you're not talking just so that we can have um, everybody be heard and have good discussion. So the domain that we're covering today, neurological systems, require data from multiple biological scales in order to represent very complex dynamics of both single, scale, single cells and networks. We may be modeling all the way from the um, scale of ion channels, so um, modeling the biophysics of ion channels to modeling the membrane potential of neurons, and then we may be modeling single cells, which here can be represented by very complex geometries in the case of neurons uh, of different cell types, or we may be modeling neuronal networks, so po large populations of, of these neurons all interconnected, um, either physically or functionally, uh, and in, in this case, we are incorporating all of these different scales of data, which creates a very complex system, which leads us to our challenge in neurological in modeling neurological systems, or one of the challenges, which is reducing the complexity of these systems in order to en enable efficient computation and simulation of our models. So the mathematics of neuroscience models can um, include mechanistic differential equations, as in the case of the classic Hodgkin and Huxley model, where they simplified a model as if it were a circuit where membrane potential was modeled as a capacitance and ion, and ion channels in the cell membrane were modeled as resistors. Um, it may also include simplifying summation rules um, in the case of the integrate and fire neuron, or even model neurons at using probabilistic distribution descriptions such as a Poisson process model where spikes fire based on some probability. So given these complexities, these challenges, we have the opportunity for building software that supports large scale simulation and analysis of neurological systems models. Um, for example, NetPine, which we'll hear about today, uh, can support modeling massive um, populations of, mo of neurons. And then we also have many different, or we have two largely used um, standardized formats, including NeuroML and Sonata. And these can, using these together with the software infrastructure that we've already built, allows us to efficiently um, take models that have been built before and incorporate them to create larger and lar larger systems models, which can also, which can allow us to gain new insights about these very complex systems. So today to cover, to describe how he's addressed some of these challenges in modeling neurological systems, we have Dr. Bill Litton, who is a neurologist and professor at the State University of New York Downstate Health Sciences University. Uh, so welcome, Dr. Litton. We're excited to hear your talk on that line. Thank you. So I'll, I'll probably end up being rather discursive to try to encourage people to make some comments um, and, and make it more uh, interactive, that would be great, rather than just focusing on the technical side here. Uh, the first topic that came up that you described, uh, let me try to share, is the issue of how best to represent parts of the nervous system or the whole brain. Let's see, I found my shopping list again. That's all I can ever find. There's a, a fine talk. Um, and there's no broad agreement on that, unlike, let's say, metabolism or mitochondria, 
where I think, I, I, frankly, most organs of the body, you'll find most people taking what I consider the correct <laughs> biological approach to the organ. In the brain, uh, as soon as something comes up, whether that something uh, be the perceptrons of the 60s or the um, back propagation algorithm of the 80s or now deep learning uh, that does something cool, everyone says it's like the brain. Of course, you can trace this back to Descartes and hydraulics and whether consciousness is in the pineal uh, and all that ancient history uh, <clears throat> because the brain does cool stuff. And as soon as you find a system that does cool stuff, and just kind of, well, in the case of deep learning, okay, they have maybe a better case than most. Playing chess is pretty impressive. Playing Go, though I don't myself know how to play Go, is undoubtedly pretty impressive. Uh, but really, most of the things that brains are good at, when you just put humans aside, are really dynamics. They're motion, moving, predator, Activity is one of the highest accomplishments, sadly, of the brain, and uh, ev pet prey evasion as well. Um, and so controlling a, in, an arm, which is something we've done or attempted to do, controlling locomotion is, is some of the harder stuff. The, the really fancy stuff like playing chess, um, frankly, most humans can't even do it. And certainly no other animal can do it. Uh, it's not a really fun, it's, it's something the brain has been stretched to do to my, from my perspective. Um, and so I, 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 I'm very much in favor of using deep learning because it's a fantastic way of analyzing data. It's a fantastic way of advancing ourselves. But the idea that this is going to somehow be a, a model of the brain is, I think, mistaken. Uh, even beyond that highly simplified or really abstract metaphorical beyond that metaphorical approach uh, we also have approaches for example using integrated and fire neurons and that is something we ourselves have used um, and, and we use deep learning as well uh, so it's not you know it's not either or but my feeling is our feeling our lab's feeling is that critical elements are these cells these cells are enormously complex and this little figure here is meant to demonstrate that the cells are come in different shapes and sizes and are combined in this very complex neuro pill um, that we need to consider these enormous, these complex morphologies. So we need to consider multiple aspects of dynamics, which are not only the spiking dynamics, but also a lot of synaptic dynamics. And that underneath it all, we need to consider the chemophysiology that complements electrophysiology. And of course, the chemophysiology is what most people would be focused on entirely in most other organs and certainly uh, in modeling a prokaryote or an archaea, uh, you would not be concerned entirely, mostly about the membrane potential, although most, perhaps all of these organisms do have a membrane potential to change their membrane potentials. It's, it's, not the, it's not the main feature. So this is not to say electrophysiology is not important. Of course, it is important, but it, it's complemented by all these other factors and issues. Um, so what we end up with, as, as uh, was mentioned, is this complicated system, multiple scales of both time and space, especially as we now try more and more to get down to the molecular level um, and up to ideally whole brain level. Ironically, sadly, this whole approach suffered a setback due to getting 1 billion euros from the European Union. And you think, hey, that sounds like a good thing. I could use a billion euros, sure. But what happened was that the guy who got it, Henry Markram, whatever his strengths scientifically, and whatever his strengths politically, he somehow managed to get along with the bureaucracy in Brussels, which apparently hardly anyone can do, uh, did not get along with his colleagues. They got pissed off. This is something you may or may not have heard about. And they wrote a collective letter to nature, open letter saying, Henry sucks um, and let's get rid of him. And so the idea of using highly detailed modeling because of this letter, because of the political machinations, which political machinations are perhaps inevitable when you have a billion euros at stake, 
uh, really it, it created, I think, a bit of a setback in the field. And there's an annual award at the Society for Neuroscience for best, uh, so it's fading out here, uh, for computational neuroscience. And to my mind, it's mostly going to people who are doing really very abstract, not very biological things. So that's, that's my rant. Um, this is NetPon. That's what we're here to talk about today. So let's get to that. This is entire, almost entirely, pretty much entirely, the work of Salvador Dura Bernal, who uh, was in my lab and now is an independent researcher, still at the same institution, so we still work very closely together. He has a grant from NIBIB to develop this tool, and he's now working very closely with a postdoc, uh, Joe Graham, to uh, develop it. So those would be the two people who are really mostly in charge of this. We'll also speak a little about the GUI, the graphical user interface that's being developed for this. And uh, I'll say then uh, who's responsible for that. Uh, so the motivation is what I was saying before, that the brain, even like other organs, like the liver, the liver is already very complicated. If you want to model the liver, you've got to be able to handle uh, subcellular compart compartments, components, different kinds of cells, perhaps some cells that are motile even, immune cells. Uh, and uh, many cells that are fixed, reactions, reaction diffusion in various compartments of individual cells, interactions between cells, and then some degree of organ-wide coordination. I don't know how much that organ-wide coordination holds for the liver, but certainly there are modulators, hormonal and neuromodulators that affect how the liver functions. The brain, similarly, needs all these levels, plus you have a level of what's considered, what is information. We could talk if anybody was interested uh, or had something uh, original to say, because my observations here aren't particularly original about the limitations of Shannon information theory. That's our only good way of representing information numerically, and yet it doesn't correspond to the everyday use of the word information which is not just the potential for a message being there, but the actual message being there. So that's another level that we use a lot in our own research and that we need to connect to with our simulations that, that wouldn't be uh, something you'd see in the liver. We uh, build, built this uh, project, and this project was originally built um, it, under an, uh, an NINDS grant for modeling motor cortex. Um, to start to get away from some of the difficulties of programming that people found with neurons. So our, our simulator that we use and that is used underneath the hood in NetPine is the neuron simulator. It was developed by Michael Hines. Now I think it's in year 47 of an ongoing grant, which is really unusual to keep things going that long. Uh, he's at Yale University. He's been the primary designer. Uh, recently, Neuron, as well as NetBind, have opened up to be shared open access GitHub projects. And um, we uh, encourage, we desire, we would love to have as much participation as possible in uh, you know, making um, features available, making pull requests, et cetera, for these projects. Uh, actually, both of these projects recently uh, submitted for Chan Zuckerberg uh, software scientific software development grants. Neither of us got it. I'm just curious, any, did any of you guys get one of these? We were curious who got them. And I, I looked at the list. Most of the people who got them were major projects like Matplotlib and NumPy and Pip, so, I think, got one. So I know that uh, uh, Sarah Keating at the, right now she's at the University of College London, who was on the SVML team, uh, did get a grant to do work with the University of College London to uh, do support in general for combine type standards, including SBML right. and other things. So, uh huh. Okay. At, least so one. At, least, at least somebody biological got one. I was kind of surprised yeah. there weren't more. Well, of course, surprised and uh, unhappy that we didn't get one, but <laughs> there were right. more that were <laughs> biological. Um, and even I don't even think there were that many that were scientific per se. Say, I mean, NumPy, of course, you need NumPy, sure, but I wouldn't call it scientific software. It's generic. You could use it for accounting. It's generic numerical software. We, anyway. we tried. We tried as well. We didn't get it. Okay. 
they only awarded 10%, I think. Right. Well, 10% is about what NIH rewards. So that's, yeah. that's normal. <laughs> that's, that's that's, that shouldn't bother us. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, uh, anyway. It's I, I also think uh, uh, Image J, I think Kevin Elisieri, the oh, other one. Right. So one of the fMRI or MRI type ones got it. I didn't see, there was no surf, was like free surfer. It didn't, didn't uh, of course, I don't know if these guys put in, but they'd be the obvious candidates or EEG tool. Uh, Scott Makig's thing would have been an obvious one to have put in. Yeah, I didn't see, I was, I was dismayed not to see more people doing science with a software tool, let's put it that way. Mm. Okay, so uh, what do we need to do? We need to get the user away from writing neuron code, away from writing loops. Uh, and initially, uh, for the, anyone, uh, well, People, both people are familiar and unfamiliar with Neuron. Neuron had its own interpreter. So again, Neuron dates back, actually the, the grant dates back 47 years. Neuron now dates back 50 years. Um, and it had its interpreter based on Hoke, which was a Kernahan program. I know Herb loves history of computer science. Well, this is classic <laughs> stuff, man. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know that. So the Hoke language was in one of the original Unix books and was stood for higher order calculator. It's a very simple language, but over decades, it was agglutinatively put together with other stuff. So it became a fairly complex, complex not only an object-oriented language, but it had two different kinds of objects, one for the cells, which were one kind of object, and others for more typical objects like vectors and lists and things like that. Uh, so it got horribly complicated. Fortunately, that has been largely abandoned, although you'll still find it if you look through the model database, ModelDB, uh, where we have about 600 plus neuron-based models, neuron simulator-based models, as well as 400 some other models that do neural simulation uh, using other tools such as Nest, Brian, um, Genesis, just straight MATLAB, Fortran, C, C++. Uh, so Hulk was terrible. Everything's now been moved to Python. Everything's now pretty clean, but you still have the problem of doing programming in this complex environment where you want to reach down to the level of molecules, integrate with the level of electrophysiology, get the whole cell to work together, get cells to connect together with synapses that themselves may be dynamic. Uh, so we, we, we found in our own research that it just, even for people who are good programmers, it becomes unmanageable to work across these multiple scales. And so we wanted to go from what's on the right here for GID, where GID would be the global identifier because typically you're gonna run these things on HPC, so you need to have global identifiers to distinguish them across nodes into something like on the left that was a simple declaration based mostly on Python dicts, dictionaries. Um, and that uh, simplification now makes the, the, a declarative code readable where previous procedural code was very difficult to read depending on the quality of the programming in part or in the degree of comment, comment, commenting. But uh, this was a, a major motivation, standardized and uh, separated from implementation issues which are all handled now in the back end. And they were handled before partly back end. Uh, let's see, next slide. Uh, the other thing, as I mentioned, is we want to be able to handle parallelization readily. So typically, as you start to put your simulations together, but typically you want to build on top of what someone else has done. You want to, you know, stand on the shoulders of giants, just like Newton did. Um, <clears throat> but uh, you know the other side of that phrase. Uh, I really could have gotten stuff done, except those damn giants kept standing on my shoulders. I hope you've heard that. Uh, so you start on your machine, you build something, it gets bigger and bigger, and now it's too big for your laptop, it's too big for your workstation, and you got to put it onto HPC. So one thing that <coughs> Salvador did, and was key, is to make sure that it would be easy just to move directly from one to the other. Ideally, just say, we submit it. You have to still learn PBS or Torque or Slurm, but then you submit it. Um, and generally, we use the same integrators. We try to stick with one integrator. Neuron offers a lot of different integrators. Uh, and there are issues, of course, with the different integrators. One thing that makes neural simulation somewhat 
different from other areas. Well, I guess you could say this is true in the immune system as well in terms of simulation. We do use ODEs, ODEs that stand in for PDEs really throughout the simulation of the single neuron. But then when it comes to communicating between neurons, we do not do what Hodgkin Huxley did, which is simulate the axon. We don't, we leave it out. It takes too much time to simulate. And the general assumption, right or wrong, and undoubtedly it's both right and wrong, it's partially right, is <clears throat> that the signal that comes out of a neuron through an axon, and this is different from dendrodendritic synapses, which are a total other problem, the signal that comes out for a, from a neuron will be delivered with reasonable fidelity to a postsynaptic neuron. And so all we do there is this is handled as an event. So an event happens in the presynaptic neuron and is now delivered after a delay, two to four milliseconds typically to the postsynaptic neuron, which has all of its own intrinsic dynamics for handling that event through some kind of a synaptic mechanism, whether that be GABA, GABA-B, uh, et cetera. I'm just getting a call from the, my chief at the hospital. That is a very bad sign. Luckily, I ignored it, um, <clears throat> but I have to better call her back later. Anyway, uh, <laughs> um, God knows, I hope they don't want me to work. That'd be terrible. So, what was I saying? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> um, so, event is it, it, that aspect of it is event driven, and uh, the so you have ODEs. PDEs, chemical uh, interactions, diffusion, reaction diffusion, electrophysiological reactions handled in a Hodgkin Huxley way, all then feeding down into a soma, axon initial segment, event delivered to postsynaptic cells. When you do the HPC version, the cells are going to be on different nodes, different boxes, different. If you're using, Go we use Google Cloud, we actually had a problem with this, perhaps different parts of the continent and then things get a bit slow and that screws us up. Um, <clears throat> but now we've, we've worked with Google to try to at least make sure that we're on, like if not in a rack, on a rack, at least in a room so that there's a comparative, uh, so there's reasonable timing between the nodes. Um, we have published this, uh, it came out in eLife. Uh, I, I, I recommend eLife to you guys because they have, uh, you'll see on the bottom here, uh, let's see, I, I have a pointer, right? But I wouldn't want to, let's see if I can activate the pointer. Uh, pointer, there's the pointer. But now I somehow ended up going one slide ahead. Now I lost my mouse, fell out, there we go. Uh, they have something called uh, tools and resources. So if you apply for tools and resources, I think overall you get a much better shot at uh, getting a, a paper in there than you might if you apply to a pure, like a pure research paper. Um, okay, so we uh, have this complicated layout, but basically cell models typically are written in, or at least the cell morphologies are written in pure neuron. They can be brought in from NeuroML, they can be brought in from Sonata <clears throat> and some other formats. So again, we're trying to be, uh, as, as eclectic as possible, then from some of these other ones, they can be read out to Nest or Brian or one of the other simulators. Uh, we have these declarative language, then internally we're going to do network instantiation, and then we can come out to parallel simulation via the neuron simulator, and then we can do analysis. So analysis and saving, uh, here I've mentioned save to NeuroML, also save to, uh, of course, other outputs, Pandas, or MATLAB, type formats or even Excel, God forbid, uh, from NeuroML or Sonata, you may be able to get into Brian Nest, Moose, I forgot to mention, Pine, I forgot to mention. <clears throat> um, so, I mean, this is a bit uh, uh, redundant of what we said before, but I did want to introduce the NetPine GUI, which is another part of NetPine is to really reach out to the experimental community and to the extent, uh, this was a neuron originally has done, uh, it, I was going to say, has tried to do, but it's been pretty successful getting experimentalists to use it. Uh, this is meant to be much easier. And if the declarative language itself is not easy enough, which it's not, <laughs> um, it, then there's a GUI. And I'm going to show the GUI here on a YouTube video that was last year's GUI, just to get a 
sense of it, but actually this is being completely redone. And the people redoing, ah, ow! I better stop that. How did, did you hear that extremely loudly? No. Uh, it's here. Let me. No, we didn't hear it at all. We didn't hear anything. We didn't hear it at all. Okay. Well, I was like, just like knocking me out here. So I don't know how to make you guys hear it. Is there a button for that? You don't need to hear it. It's music. I'm sorry. Anyway, I'm just going to mute it for myself then. Um, anyway, so I can speak over it. That's easier. Um, so this was last year's version. Uh, this is being done by the Metacell company. They are based in Boston and London. Uh, the person primarily behind it is uh, Matteo Matteo uh, Cardinini. I'm missing his name. That's not quite right, but it's, that's pretty close. Though. Uh, the uh, general idea is that you can create your cells. Uh, typically, if it's a complex cell, of course, you would import your cell. This being a what we'd call a uh, ball and stick model. You could even create just a dendrite with a ball or rather a cylinder for a soma. Uh, you can create cells of certain types. You can save them. Uh, there's this whole mod language thing, which is also being revamped, uh, which is a compiled language that links in to Neuron for doing ch ion channels typically, but also synapses. Um, you can create a whole set of different so here's a complex cell. Clearly, you would want to import that. You're not going to write that. Uh, it, you get a lot of visualization tools. You get a lot of control tools. You can run it. You can submit it to an HPC, get the data back, and analyze the data. Uh, well, this is all still to come to some extent. This actually it was working pretty well, but now they're redoing it completely. So it'll be a little while, and then it'll be working very well again. Um, and they're under contract uh, with us as well as with uh, open source brain. So part of, I think the revamping uh, is to get it to be really the same tool in both open source brain and NetPine. Uh, so things can really move back and forth between those two very, very easily at least. Uh, and of course, the more tools we can incorporate or import from or export to, the, the better off we are in terms of uh, being available to wider segments of the community who may be, uh, in many cases, set up just to use uh, some particular tool. Okay, so that's, that's the show, different analysis tools. I think that's gonna come up in my other slides as well. The specifications, everything standardized. Uh, so you set up a population of cells before you even know what may be the cell population uh, uh, is made up of, and then you can set up the cell properties that went into that. Uh, again, trying to reach down more and more to reaction diffusion. Reaction diffusion is a project between me and Michael Hines and Robert McDougall, the latter two being at Yale, who, uh, and certainly Robert and uh, Robert McDougall and Adam Newton are the primary drivers here in terms of really doing the coding. Um, here, again, we are looking always, in both cases, we're always looking for more driving projects. And you guys know very well about driving projects. What are the two kinds of projects, Herb? The driving project and the something uh, else project? Service, service and collaborator projects. Service and collaborative. All right, I'll yeah. again what the difference there is. But anyway, we need people who want to use our stuff, of course, as you guys do. And uh, it, to the extent that you, you, you folks are down at this level of molecular, uh, if, if you have ideas for us, whether you can do them for us, ideally you're doing them, but if you're not, even if you're not doing it, if you have some good ideas for us, we can maybe find some students to, to work on it where mm. we have something. Uh, obviously this, uh, well, maybe not obvious, but should, uh, it's obvious to me. Uh, how how important? It's purely aspirational because we don't have these organelles in any kind of detail. How, how important is the diffusion component at the subcellular level? Well, it is biologically, it is very important. I mean, I in mean, terms of your the questions you're trying to ask, I guess, answer. Well, yeah. So, I mean, our my lab's main motivation or a major motivation is to understand medical neuroscience, mm -hmm. so psychiatry and neurology, and mm -hmm. that involves molecular agents mm -hmm. uh, and so one of the things we're doing we just made it easier to use 
an extracellular reaction to fusion. So as a drug comes in, where does it go? How does it get there? Uh, we're going to place blood vessels. We're going to watch the stuff flow. Uh, so I'd say from the perspective of trying to understand neurological and psychiatric disease, it's very important. To my mind, even if you're just trying to understand, just understand the normal physiology of the brain, it's also very important. I mean, Avrama Blackwell, some of you may know, she's been doing this stuff for years. She has a nice article called Calcium, the Answer to Everything, a mm. title similar to that. Uh, calcium is, is, is kind of hand in hand with electrical potentials in the cell mm. to provide signaling and communicate among uh, the various aspects. And that's what's shown here on the right, the centrality of calcium to only a few of the aspects. Here we're connecting to the endoplasmic reticulum, we have a circuit pump, we have a leak from the endoplasmic reticulum, and we have IP3. Um, so uh, my answer is very important. G well, yeah, but we build, I mean, we build models of um, signaling networks, but we don't consider diffusion as Right. So one of the um, things that we think makes diffusion perhaps more important than neurons is that they have these very... They're uh, big. They're big. And they've got these elongated yeah, okay. dendrites, elongated neurites. Yeah. And then you have the spines. The spines are a total mystery. Are they electrical components okay, or are they I chemical see. components? Or most likely both. Yeah, uh, okay. And they're tiny. And you can have as little as at base, you know, basically no calcium ions in there. And then suddenly in this inrush of calcium and everything presumably gets turned on, but maybe at different rates. And then some of it's going to leak out through that spine neck. It's stuff going on. But the answer so are you is thinking really of simulating just a single cell at this level or an entire population? Well, typically at this level, we would be currently simulating a single cell. Right. We might do it in the, at the population level is have a lot of simplified cells and then have one yeah. of these cells there to see what goes on at this level. Yeah, okay. Um, connectivity specificity, again, a lot of details here. We've worked uh, on this project very closely with Gordon Shepard Jr. at Northwestern, and he had... Uh, S Crackham data, Let's see if I can remember what that stands for, but it's uh, basically allows you to know where individual inputs come into the cells from different structures. So where do the thalamic inputs come into M1 motor cortex? Where do those somatosensory in inputs come in, the S1 inputs? Where do the M2 inputs? Where are the contralateral inputs? And then our tool, NetPine, allows you to lay them out on the dendrites appropriately. Uh, again, levels, 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 parallel, and now get to analysis, trying to incorporate tools that people routinely use and ideally, again, have contributors who provide more tools that other people might want to use, uh, including a lot of these information tools, normalized transfer entropy, Granger causality, both of which have their drawbacks and their critics because neither of them are really great. Uh, but we find that they can be useful <laughs> and so we use them. Uh, again, this everything is um, a, a somewhat limited. So here we would be showing a, a, what's called a raster plot. Every dot here is an individual spike in a cell. These are different populations of cell, excitatory cells of layer two, inhibitory cells of layer two, down to layer five in this case, individual cells with kind of classical Hodgkin-Huxley spiking representation. Uh, different analysis of convergence and connectivity uh, at the top, <clears throat> spiking. Uh, we have now some nice data in vivo from a uh, mouse from a group down in Irvine, I think, uh, which we've tried to match uh, uh, to the data that we get out of our models. Uh, building up to local field potentials, to what's called CSD, current source density plots, uh, and eventually working now, uh, or work independent by Stephanie Jones at Brown and her group, building up to MEG signals and magnetoencephalograms and electroencephalograms. Uh, and fMRI, uh, or thinking about it anyway. Data saving, different formats, Sonata, including Sonata. Um, <clears throat> GUI I mentioned, batching. Uh, one thing we found, I don't know what your experience is, is we have very limited success with our university cluster. 
In fact, at this point, so limited that we threw out the university cluster. We actually have all kinds of horrible problems. We have a new university cluster, which we're just going to start using. But in any case, it's obvious it's not going to have the kind of uh, number of nodes or uh, speed or anything that the XSEED clusters have. That's the one that was shared uh, out of um, San Diego Supercomputer and the Texas TAC group. Uh, that stands for. Uh, one project I should mention is a project of Amit uh, Majumdar and Subha Sivignasam, uh, which is called the Neuroscience Gateway uh, out of San Diego Supercomputer. They're NSF funded and they provide a front end, which is much more readily accessible than getting XSEED time. In fact, the last XSEED time application was turned down. Um, but we can work through Neuroscience Gateway to submit directly on a web form these, uh, these NetPine jobs, Neuron jobs, and it also reaches out to a lot of other things. FreeSurfer, I think, for example, and uh, Brian, um, and something you might ask them about, I guess they are neuroscience dedicated, but uh, I, I, I would think they might benefit from more SBML level things. And on the topic of SBML, by the way, if you have anybody who would be interested in collaborating, we're about halfway through our SBML import export uh, tool and paper. <laughs> so somebody could get a paper out of it, you know, a rotator mm -hmm. or something that would want to work with us on that because uh, that would be very helpful for us, of course. What kind of collaboration? Well, whatever you all want. I mean, I was thinking of a student and, and you, Herb, and, you know, of course, we get your names on a paper, and, uh, but what we really need is uh, the, some, a little, some coding. So to the extent that you could take some of the code that you guys already use and uh, port it over to what we have. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Good, good sense of how, how generic the, the code will be for something like that. We yeah, yeah, yeah. We'd be interested. yeah, we'd be interested in that, yeah. That would sure. be great. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we've had a lot more success with Google Cloud, uh, but it's expensive. We put uh, we put over a hundred thousand dollars into it. Uh, oh wow! And uh, we also got a grant on that, which was great. Uh, we're going to hear about whether that's being continued or not soon. Because hmm. that, of course, there's a lot of money. That they, part of the grant is that give you the time, uh, substantial amounts of time. What was the problem with the university cluster? It was too small. It was just too cumbersome too to use. Well, the first problem is doesn't bear mentioning. It was the air conditioning failed. Okay, <laughs> that was it. Was a disaster. I mean, it's a half a million dollars. Uh, I'm not going to tell you because what if somebody at NIH hears about it? Actually, yeah, well, it's not oh, NIH yeah. funds, but it was indirectly, I'm sure. Anyway, yeah. Whatever. Okay. Uh, it was a disaster. So now we have a proper room. We got a new cluster, but yes, too small. Too small. Okay. Too small. Okay. Uh, batches. So in addition to running these enormous simulations, which run across HPCs, then you might want to run a uh, paper we just uh, just got accepted uh, by my uh, student, uh, now graduated, Mohammed Sharif, uh, was 2,000 simulations. So uh, and these, that wasn't even that big, but uh, some of these we can we can suck up time very fast. Uh, everything's on netpine.org. And I think I'll just stop there. I think we're ready for discussion. And All right. Does anybody have any questions they want to jump in on? Ready to unmute and ask. Or I can just keep talking. <laughs> I have more slides. This was a, a talk from a previous hour-long talk. So I, can, I can go on and on. Or I can give more of my own personal philosophy. I have experience. one question about yes, just a uh, what you say you are using SVML. What at what level is SVML entering into these models? We're not because our SVML importer is inadequate. <laughs> okay. Uh, but or, or would we, it we, enter we, into? That? We would like to be. So, uh, I, from what I understand from the the vCell folk, and I, I we probably have some vCell folk on online here, right? Uh, the vCell was. It consulting with SBML to get diffusion into SBML. I mean, typically SBML classically has been well mixed. Uh, we would like to import reaction schemes, uh, especially let's say G protein. I don't know how much that's available, frankly. Uh, last time we looked, we identified, well, last time was when we had the postdoc version, this was like four years ago. Uh, we identified several models that we would like to make use of. 
Uh, even simple basic models that have neural significance, circadian rhythm models that we would like to import and just make available as a, as a in this case, something of a controlling element in a large, could be a controlling element in large network simulation. Uh, so I think the short answer to your question is I don't know. I don't have any particular models in mind, but. Do you have your own, that, you have your own solver? Do you have your own solver? We have access to a bunch of solvers. One of them was the original solver, which was a Crank Nicholson that was uh, written by Michael Hines, you know, adopted rather by Michael Hines. These are ODE solvers now, right? Yeah. These are ODE solvers. Then we have the event queue and management of the event queue. Uh, then we have standard solvers like LSOTA, CVODE yeah. available. We have the, you know, an explicit Euler and implicit Euler. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but we can always also use more solvers, sure. Uh, I mean, but no, I'm thinking, I'm thinking we could just integrate uh, Roadrunner into it. That that would be great. I mean, a lot of the way yeah. Neuron has been built is agglutinative. It's yeah. uh, picked up a piece here, a piece there. Uh, our RxD part is making use of uh, some of the, tip, you know, I'd have to look actually, because I'm, I'm not even sure which uh, solvers, solver or solvers we're making most use of in, in the, the actual. Well, we should meet up afterwards then, I guess, sometime yes, ne next great. week or week after. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll arrange we'll something. To, We'll have to pull in Robert and Adam because they actually okay. do this stuff. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, but yeah. Hi, Bill. I, I have a question. Oh. This is Raj. Yeah. Hey, hey, Raj. Hey. Uh, so uh, this is prompted by what what you said earlier about uh, the models that are typically shown at uh, CNS meetings, and also Herb's question about the uh, diffusion or um, the use of uh, diffusion and so on. I wonder if you can point to uh, things of that nature that are routinely used in the context of the NetPoint and neural network models that you build that may not be that uh, th that widely used or considered when, when looking at biochemistry or signaling pathways of typical kind. Is there some sense of the, um, not techniques as much as uh, modeling considerations, if you will. I well, know. I mean, the one that we've been working on a lot recently, two of them we've been working on a lot, is ischemia models. And this is, and part of it is, of course, extracellular delivery of nutrients, delivery of oxygen primarily, but also a whole set of responses intracellularly having to do with shutting down the cell, with necrosis, with necrosis with autophagy, uh, with um, uh, the uh, uh, process of some cells exploding, basically, um, and uh, where that trade-off comes. Uh, a related topic is called spreading depression in the brain. Uh, so you also have ischemia with spreading depression. Um, our epilepsy models, I'm anxious to get some of those into with more extracellular because there's a lot of issues of changes in extracellular volume as well as changes in potassium uh, concentrations. Um, but I, I think it's a very widespread. I, I guess I'm not quite answering your question. I don't know. Should, is that what yeah, I mean, are, are there are things that you do in here? Uh, for example, the extracellular components, right? So the connecting the extracellular to intracellular is that uh, pretty much part and parcel of how you think about building these. Um, that's how I think about. That's how I think they work. <laughs> I think it's. I think, uh, for example, a very underappreciated organelle is endoplasmic reticulum. It's remarkable the amount of penetration of endoplasmic reticulum into every part of the neuron, as well as other cells, of course, but just that they reaching up into the dendrites and even into spines. Um, and uh, I tend to think this is really critical. Uh, there's one very clever paper with absolutely no evidence behind it that suggests that the endoplasmic reticulum might itself be excitable. And so it might be a neuron within the neuron, the, the, the creature within. Uh, but at the very least, it has a lot to do with calcium handling. Uh, so I think that's absolutely vital as to how much we can make use of it. Not so much. Right now, when we include it at all, it's included as a volume fraction. So we're not dealing with anything to do with its geometry, which is somewhat 
unknown uh, or not well described in any readily consolidated form. I think it's all very important. That's why we embarked on this now about 10 years ago to, to include reaction diffusion in, in this field where really the focus has been electrophysiology. There's some people who have really been looking at this for a long time. Abramo Blackwell, I mentioned, Eric DeShooter has worked on this for a long time. Jim Schwaber has thought about this for a long time. So um, certainly not, we're not the first to think about it, but try to make it more doable. It's been hard to do. How about macromolecular complexes, like scaffolds and... Uh... I know Avrama has done something with these, uh, what is it called, A, A hyphen something, these anchor, big uh, macromolecular anchors. I haven't, we haven't. Um, one, one thing that we need to do more of is just to allow for uh, localization of membrane associated proteins so that we can identify their location on, on the radial basis. So right now it's just longitudinal long adendrite. But yeah, I, I, no doubt that's very important. I don't know enough about it. Thank you, Bill. I, I have a question. Um, I'm, I'm with um, in the car lab and we focus on uh, building biochemical models of entire cells. And it, it, one of our uh, key philosophies is that um, these models are complex and that a key um, approach to making them feasible is to be able to combine together multiple submodels, as we call them, of different pathways in the cell in order to achieve um, whole cell models. And I'm wondering whether you think about uh, the reusability of neuron and, and net pine models in uh, building larger uh, net pine models and whether that can help you achieve the ambitions you have. Yeah, we do think about it. We do make use of it. It's um, in model DB, model database, which is based out of Yale, was originally based out of Neuron, but also incorporates other pieces, pieces from other simulators now, is a repository. Of, I, I mean, I go there like I go to a, uh, like one used to go <laughs> to a used car lot. Hey, I need a good model of this sodium channel. Maybe I can find one in this model, which I vaguely remember has that, you know, NAV 1.5 or NAV 1.6. Um, and so we, we pull out pieces. Uh, they are generally mo modular. The uh, mod language, which is this compiled language that fits into Neuron, and thereby fits into NetPine, is, uh, is an old language actually from the 1970s, which was built as the uh, bio, I'm not going to get this right, but it's something like a biomedical research language uh, and was a, a precursor to things like SBML and, and uh, the, these various uh, uh, languages for, for modeling uh, biochemistry. So it was an early biochemistry modeling language that then I think its only use now is in neuron. I think it's been long abandoned by your community. But absolutely, pieces put together. So all the chemistry pieces are coming in through this reaction diffusion component of neuron that we've developed. And we put it together with the electrophysiology and it's all multi-scale. And yes, absolutely, all this stuff needs to be put together. And the more we can grab things from other people and other communities, and that's where I was thinking SBML, and maybe some of these pieces that we, we need. Metabolics, we don't have much metabolics. Obviously, everything runs on metabolics. And if you're doing ischemia, and you don't have mitochondria, you're, you're missing a piece to say the least. So we'd love to have some mitochondria in there. Hello, I have a question. Um, it's rather a general question. Uh, you, you mentioned this sort of, these remarks, these controversial sort of interaction with uh, Markram and so forth. 
And I think sort of that stems to his original comments when trying to secure the funding about, you know, we should be able to simulate the brain completely in 20 years or something like that. So now you can obviously criticize that with like sort of hindsight and say that was just completely unrealistic. Well, it's, 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 also, it's also grantsmanship, right? Well, that's, oh. that's, what, I, that's what my <laughs> question was going to be. How, how do you then sort of more modestly propose um, what we should be achieving with these types of models in the next 20 years. So what, what in your view is is the correct like goals and aims that we should try and fulfill within yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, to some extent, I, I, I guess I was too strong there because I generally agree on, you know, let a, let a hundred flowers bloom or a thousand or how many flowers that was, uh, that, you know, everybody should be, we should be trying different things because nobody knows what's going to result in the paradigm shift. It's not even a paradigm shift because we don't have a paradigm. We're paradigmless. Uh, what's going to find us a paradigm? We don't even have epicycles for gosh sakes. Uh, I tend to think that we should be middle out. So some people want to be purely top down and let's just say that the deep learning approach is purely top down. They've designed a system, it can do cool things. It can do things that brains do as a top-down viewpoint. I think David Marr's approach, some people may be familiar with, was a top-down viewpoint. That he said, what's the problem the brain is trying to solve? Let's start with that. Uh, the way Henry presented himself, and I don't think this is necessarily the way he thinks, uh, but it was as a bottom-up guy. We're gonna get the channels, we're gonna put them together, we're gonna build it. And, you know, if you, if you can build it, you know, you understand it. As Carver Mead's famous comment, or, no, Feynman's famous guy. Uh, I think they both said something similar to that. Uh, bottom up is, I mean, even if it's possible, let's say we can do a nice bottom up model of area CA1 of hippocampus. Well, how far has that gotten you? Because now you got to go do a model of thalamus. Now you got to do a model of claustrum. Now you got to do a model of different parts of cortex. Now you got to do in the spinal cord. And actually, these are all areas that we're kind of interested in trying to do. So middle out, to my mind, is multi-scale, figure out what you can leave out from the lower levels, figure out what you need to incorporate, trial and error. Try to incorporate some aspects of what the brain is trying to do. The best we can come up with right now is information theory. Our systems can't play chess, or far from it, although we did get one that kind of controlled an arm rather poorly. So that was nice that we actually did something attached it to a robot arm and made a nice video out of that. Uh, so we want to be moving in both directions and exploring. Uh, it's all exploration. If when an experimentalist comes up with something new, I mean, the only reason they came up with it is because we're looking at the lamppost for our keys because that's where the light is. But so they came up with something. Let's look at it. Let's explore it. Let's see what its consequences might be. Any other questions? I guess the question I had, which is going back to kind of the reaction diffusion um, questions was how good the data is that is available in online databases for incorporating those into neuroscience models or if it's, if you primarily have to collect all that data on your own for the models you're building. Well, we don't collect it. We're a pure modeling. Collaborators. So, uh, we would love to collect the data on our own, but we don't have the skills. <laughs> um, yeah. One of the reasons that I'd be interested in getting more stuff out of your community is because you all have collected that data. And yes, a liver cell or yeast is different than a nerve cell, but that's where the data is. That's where we would want to grab it from. Uh, the problem of missing data is not, unfortunately, just in reaction diffusion. We have entirely missing data on the wiring diagram. Most people think the wiring diagram is not everything, but it's at least important. And yet all we can do is randomize wiring based on approximate densities of connectivity. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of places where we have vast gaps. And we see part of our role, and I'm sure you see part of your role, is identifying where there's some critical information that we could ideally co-opt an experimentalists and get them to find out for us. Mm -hmm. um, also kind of on the that idea of missing data, um, I was wondering in NetPine specifically, if you want, if you don't have information about the density of synaptic connections, but you have some 
information about functional connectivity. Uh, is there a way to incorporate that effectively in terms of like to represent it either as probability of connections or is that not yeah. really? I mean, by functional connectivity, when people use that phrase in the context of the brain, they mostly mean fMRI data. And mm -hmm. we're usually not, we're really entirely not at that scale. So we're, our connectomics is micro connectomics, mm -hmm. uh, but we can get functional connectivity idea just from the relations of dynamics of input cells, output cells. And yes, we do make use of that because ideally, we, well, I think usually we can see that we can generate the model based on uh, relatively low level phenomenology, such as the dynamics of firing of individual cells. Mm -hmm. And then from that, get the emergent properties at the network level where we see oscillations at the right frequencies. Uh, but sometimes, and, and so ideally we'd like to predict the functional properties and then give that the experimental instance for, to check. But some, sometimes we do need to make use of that as well to, uh, to fit our models. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's always the risk. If you fit your model on everything that you possibly could know, then you're not gonna be able to make a prediction that, that anywhere. Right. All right, last call for questions. Okay, I think we're gonna wrap up then. Thank you, Dr. Litton, so much Thank for you. presenting Thank today. And I hope you all join next month for our session on cancer. And so uh, uh, probably we're not that interested in cancer, but some of your talks I'm sure we're very interested in. Are they open to the community? They are, yeah. Um, are I can- announced on your website? Mm. Yes. Yes, they are all announced on, on the on the reproducible biomodels website. Great. All right. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Thanks.